So welcome today to Kelly Fawner and Donna McNear to Echo Ties. I'm turning it over to you, team, to uh, share your passions and, and tell us about writing. Welcome. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here to talk about scribbling. It's a passion uh, that Donna and I share is this passion for all things literacy, but, um, but especially writing. And I think we, one of the things as Donna and I were preparing this information is that we realized that um, scribbling or, or the whole idea of writing falls sentence, second to literacy. And then I'm gonna let Donna take it from here. Good morning, everybody. And Thank you, Kelly. And Kelly, should we just say a couple things about ourselves, sure. our background? So, yeah. So I, I guess I just want to share with you that I come from a background in the field of visual impairments. So when Kelly and I uh, present information, we always include a bit about uh, the field of visual impairments and, and blindness. So we have some content related to that. And um, Kelly and I both have backgrounds in early childhood. I had a classroom for six years at, at one point. And I'm in Minnesota. And that's been where um, I've lived as an adult and in my professional career. And I happen to also be an orientation and mobility specialist. So because we're in low incidence, I like people to know that. So go ahead, Kelly. And my backgrounds as a special educator, as Donna said, I worked in ch early childhood um, as a teacher and an assistive technology consultant for a number of years before it was called assistive technology. Um, and then I worked for a statewide project in Pennsylvania for 10 years, uh, came to Wisconsin to work on my PhD in urban education and research and um, started a business in consulting. So I now and um, do a lot of consulting and training but I'm also a virtual teacher. Um, so I have several students that are homebound, um, homeschooled for multiple reasons. Um, and so I enjoy uh, using the things that we talk about in these sessions with my students on my caseload. So again, welcome everyone. Thanks, Kelly. And I'm going to launch us with the um, slide that's um, on the screen right now. It's titled Reading the Focus of Early Literacy. And then the STEM is writing, AKA or also known as the neglected half of literacy. And um, there's a couple photos on, on this slide and uh, Kelly and I both happen to be grandmas. And so um, it's easy to get some photos um, and get permission. Uh, to put into our presentations because of that. But on the um, left side of the screen, you see photos of Kelly's granddaughter, Lola. And when we were perusing our, our photos to, to look at slides of scribbling and also what we call mark making, um, Kelly found a lot on reading and Lola reading and looking at reading. And I had to really search on the right hand, uh, that's me with my twin grandkids, Max and Lily in a grandma day at preschool. And that's where I happened to find a, um, some write, a writing photo. But we, we do a lot with young kids on, on reading and emergent. And when we think about emergent literacy, we often go to reading rather than thinking about really emphasizing the writing or the scribbling or the mark making. So uh, that's why we're launching into this. So get a little bit more information about us. So I like to get us all in the same space when we um, uh, do a session on a topic. So I call it a pop start comes from watching NBC in the morning show. So we have some foundational ideas uh, to help you get in our space and talking about scribbling. So when we talk about kids and when we reference what we're thinking about and where we've gone and how we've come with our content today, we think about all kids, 
all places and all kids learning. So all kids meaning kids who do not have disabilities and some who are identified as having disabilities, all places where kids learn, school, home, daycares, and so forth, and that all kids learn. And so we also like to believe in examining our practices. And so this uh, uh, going into scribbling is truly, uh, Kelly and I examine practices, what we've always done, and rethinking what we do moving forward with scribbling. And it's about collaborative thinking. So what a, a collaborative group um, we have here um, this morning. And then we also like to challenge myths, what's always been done, and uh, opening our thinking to doing other things. Don, I just wanted to mention that we do have majority of people on today are OTs, but we have SLPs, physical therapists, early intervention specialists, ABA teachers. Uh, we've got subs. Uh, we have uh, a really a wide variety of folks. And, and I'm like you. I'm excited about the diversity. That's great. Thanks, Deb, for sharing that. So about the research um, with scribbling and why is scribbling important? So we went and looked a little bit um, to enhance what we've always thought about scribbling. And I think um, Kelly and I were a little bit surprised about what the research says about scribbling. And it really talked about it's a communication experience for the child and with the child. And it's a very rich communication experience. And Scribbling, um, they talked about the supports that are needed for kids when they start scribbling to name things, that to begin to tell stories and describe experiences. So it was about expressive communication and that it was a social activity and an extension of play. And then uh, it used the term from mark making as an activity to then using marks for representation. So we're gonna spend our time in the mark making uh, space this morning. And one of the questions that we can have you all probably put into the chat is, when you think about scribbling, what's the first thing that you think about? So that Donna said, this surprised us with the research about how much scribbling was tied to expressive communication. Put your thoughts in the chat because they might match up with some of the more traditional view of scribbling. So what, as an early practitioner and for many years, um, you know, I, I thought of scribbling as fine motor skills, eye hand coordination, finger strength, pre-writing, pretend writing, and also in the context of art. And so I've really been evolving in, in how I frame scribbling um, in my teaching practices and, and work um, in collaboration with others. So go ahead, Cal. All right, I was just looking to see if Deb was seeing anything that people put into the chat other than these items. Okay, great. Um, as a parent, as a parent, uh, I think of art as as uh, pre-writing. Yes, to all of the above. Sometimes work avoidance. <laughs> Add that to the list. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this morning we're focusing on scribbling as communication and expression and literacy. So we're kind of moving away from that focus of that whole fine motor um, uh, frame. And not that we're not saying that it's not important to the development of fine motor, but also what are the other aspects that come along with scribbling? And when you're a child that can't hold a traditional tool of scribbling, how do you get the scribbling experience because it is so tied to the development of communication, the development of expression, 
and the development of literacy. So for those of us that work often with children that have complex needs, you know, how do we get the scribbling experience in for everyone is a big, you know, thing that I'm always thinking about with my students. So this is you, Cal. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Follow the pictures no on the problem. screen. So our, our, you know, we've launched into our agenda, but we're going to do a little bit more on examining kids and practices. We have some videos to share with you of typically developing kids, neurotypical kids versus kids that have challenges. Um, and we thank the families that allow us to share those videos with you. We'll talk about some teaching strategies. We'll talk about tools and adaptations. And um, as we get towards the end, we'll talk about some evaluation strategies. So this is not just all about tools, 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 right? You can't have tools without strategies and purposes. So let's take a look a little bit more about examining kids and practices. Um, as Dawn has been mentioning, you know, we look at, we often look at scribbling as a form of emergent writing. And when we look at that emergent writing and the expressive side of it, you know, you've got, we've got the quote on here that emergent writing means that children begin to understand that writing is a form of communication and their marks on paper convey a message. Uh, and so this idea of make, mark making is one that really resonates with Donna and I, because the idea of making a mark doesn't mean that right away, as soon as you're holding a, an implement of writing or an alternative type of pencil tool, that you have to write your name. <laughs> like you just need to make a mark. So it is, it's that we do see that emergent writing progresses along a developmental curriculum. Um, and that we move through these random marks and kind of the, the ending zone of it being conventional spelling. You'll see many of these, many of you probably have these kinds of charts and graphs and mnemonics that are, you know, matrices that you use that identify different kinds of scribbling and kind of the developmental process of scribbling. But again, what happens when you have a child that does it? mark make with traditional tools how do they advance through these ideas as we think about them not just as the physical act but also as the cognitive act so when i look at again kind of think progression of lola through the years it's looking at how did she make marks you know and did she make dots a lot of kids make dots as their marks first she kind of moved into alternative. She's a left-handed child. And so she's developing along her own left-handed uh, timeline, which uh, the preschool teacher does not seem to agree with, but which we're going with because that's what the path is that she's on. Um, and she started using alternatives. She loved to stick her up a thing. So she abandoned mark making, traditional mark making tools uh, um, midway through between two and three and did a lot more with uh, stickers and bubbles and other things that we're gonna be talking about later. So when we look at this idea is, is, it, is mark making, is scribbling really a hierarchy or is it more this kind of developmental process that we see this interaction between communication mark making expression so with not not necessarily looking at it as like i've got to have this skill then i've got to have this skill then this so we're asking you to to open up that that idea that traditional idea into something that might be somewhat more complex than a hierarchical order thanks kelly so when we think about it um uh opening up our ideas, think about ages and not just at what age kids do things, but um, also um, Kelly and I also thought about our older students too, who may have missed opportunities in mark making. So um, think we can think broadly about age and who can do scribbling and mark making. Um, just with older kids, I don't think we refer to it as scribbling, but um, you know, expressive communication 
possibly, or a written communication. And then the tools, the variety of tools, and, and we'll be uh, dipping into that to give you ideas. It's not necessarily comprehensive of everything out there, but certainly um, a place for you to launch from. And then when we think about when kids scribbling is the location, where are they? So a lot of times kids are on the floor. Um, they're not at a table and um, they're outside um, with chalk doing mark making and with water. So um, to open up our DI ideas about um, where kids scribble. So we're going to um, uh, frame um, uh, scribbling by looking at an actual video of uh, a typical kids scribbling. So um, Kelly and I like to look at back to all kids um, to have a reference for um, what we're doing with kids who have exceptionalities. And so what we're going to do is look at a video of uh, my oldest granddaughter, Olivia, when she was 17 months and um, a scribbling uh, experience with her mom. And I just want to tell you, Olivia is now 15 years old. So this is an old video. And for me, it's an experience in reflective practice to look at what I was doing on the side, what I was saying. And, um, you know, all these years later, I would um, change that, but this is what it looked like. And so it, it also gives you a reference at what some kids might be doing at 17 months. So we'll take a look at it. Let's write your name. Look. O L I M V. What does, what's your name? What's your name? Oops, sorry. Blake. Hey, come here. What's this? Olivia. Olivia, yeah. Is that it, Cal? At the end. Okay, thank you. So, you know, when I watch this now, my takeaways are is look at all the movement she was doing um, and um, all the turn taking going on. And she really wanted to control the content, the subject matter. And wh where she was going with that was her own experience. She wanted her mom to. Um, draw pictures and talk about where she went to daycare. So she was talking about um, her daycare person's children who were there. She was talking about a dog and she wanted her mom to do that. She was not about the word Olivia, which is, you see, where the teacher in, in, in me went. You know, I, I saw it as, as this whole um, a more conventional literacy experience. And um, she's proving to me that it's about all those things that the research says it is. And so it, it's, 
it's a good reference to to look at to help us problem solve and think about our uh, children with disabilities and how would we accommodate and support to try and um, give them the opportunities to do this kind of communication with mark making. I love your comment about washable markers. I cringed when I saw that red marker on the white rug. <laughs> tiled floor. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a tile floor, right. So, um, so just help to further um, uh, think about what kids do with scribbling is they imitate adults and older children. So you saw a lot of that turn taking with Olivia and her mom because, um, uh, Olivia wanted to imitate what her mom did, and she wanted her mom to do some of that expression too. And so it's about pretend play. Um, also, it's about using adult tools. And in this photograph, I like it because uh, it represents to me, you know, you have a, a young child sitting on a dad's lap and, uh, you know, children are, are all about the tools that they're um, that they see the adults use in their life. It's not just scribbling with a marker because that's not what they see adults do. They wanna do what adults are using and they like to create and then play simple games with scribbling too. So then we take a look at how are kids with disabilities scribbling? And so we're going to, um, look at a couple of the children who have been in um, our lives um, with scribbling. And um, so we're gonna go to another video. And this is Ethan, he is now Olivia's age. Um, he's in my community, he's blind. And um, when I uh, was watching uh, Olivia scribbling at like um, 15 months and, and younger and so forth, um, I was Ethan's teacher and I was looking at how do I replicate that experience of scribbling when you're blind. And so we're gonna see Ethan, he's about one year old, he's at home. He's got a, a tool called a Mountbatten Brailler, uh, which isn't available anymore in the way you see it now. And so we're just going to take a look at um, Ethan and um, what I'm calling mark making with Braille. And you will hear Ethan's mom and you'll hear Ethan's brother chatting while he is mark making. And I love this term mark making with the, you know, with the mark maker of his future. Thank you, Kelly. I'm Yeah. Are you done, Dottie? Sorry. Can you go get your sandals on and go play in the bed? Oh. Oh, I love that. Okay, thanks, Kelly. So um, the, the thing that I really appreciate about this context with this particular tool is, is he's making the connection of um, pressing um, keys on what we call six dot entry 
And, and then he is actually um, touching and looking at, if you will, with his other hand, what the dots look like. So at this young age, his brain has the opportunity to make the connection between um, uh, pressing keys and that the result you get are real dots, which um, is, is a, a tough connection to make with traditional tools and for young kids who are blind. So um, uh, it just, um, you know, is a great opportunity for young children. So let's take a look at another child being introduced to um, an alternative pencil that happens to also be a part of her communication system. So this um, young child, this is Zoe, she was five at the time. Um, and I had visited her school and I had visited and all of the rest of the kids in her class were doing writing and she was off to the side talking with her, using her communication book to talk to her speech therapist about block play. She wasn't writing. And so when I asked the question, why wasn't Zoe writing like everybody else in the class, they you know, secretly on the side said to me, Zoe can't write. Well, she does have access to the alphabet. Zoe doesn't know the alphabet yet. But how do kids learn but by scribbling with the mark maker of their future? So we had an opportunity um, after school to um, have everybody sit around. And what you don't see in this video with me and Zoe is the seven other adults that are watching. Um, as I'm introducing her alphabet that's been in her communication book for a while, but people were concerned that she didn't know her letters. So why should we go to our letters? Not realizing that Kids learn their letters through scribbling their letters, right? And playing with the alphabet. <laughs> Zoe is a child that presents like someone who has Rett syndrome. Um, she has a different syndrome, but she has a lot of those um, similarities. She also is diagnosed with cortical vision impairment. So one of the things that you'll see me using with her is what her team was already doing was what to have the high powered flashlight. So it would help her focus across the page in front of her. She also does not have a, a determined selection method. Sometimes her hands work for her and she can touch the pages in front of her. Sometimes you are her partner and assist her by scanning the items and then she claps or she has a deep intake of, intake of breath. You will see all of those things happening here. But just because she didn't have, you know, alphabet knowledge and a set selection method, didn't mean we couldn't scribble. Have you done anything with ABCs? Hello? ABCs are the way, way, way back at the back, back, back. <gasps> back here. We're just going to look, look, look. These are ABCs. Those are all the alphabet. They're all back here. All of them are back here. What do you think of that? alphabets. And if I go here, I get to turn a page and they're bigger. B, C, D, E. And if I say A, Somebody's going to write that A down. Look at that. And she's going to write it on the board. Oh, a Y. Let's write down a Y. This is a portion of a 20-minute um, segment 
that through that time I was modeling to her. So I was using her tool, trying to do some of that back and forth. And anything that she landed on in any way got written down on that paper. When we stepped back and we looked at the letters that she was selecting, they were only the letters in her name. Nobody had asked her to write her name, but the letters that she self-selected were all in her first name and started her last name. So that was a great realization to the people around her of, hey, she's been taking in this information. We need to give her a way to get it out. That process no, I, is called- Excuse me, Cal, I just need to apologize. Um, I had to take a phone call. It was the Cambridge Medical Center. I had to make sure it wasn't my mother-in-law. Oh, okay. Are you, everything okay? Yep. Yep. All right. Letting you know why I took a phone call. All right. Um, with Zoe, what this process that we're doing, where you give exposure to the alphabet and let them do whatever is called free writing, F-R-E-E -E, writing. It's a process developed by Dr. Gretchen Hanser, who's an occupational therapist, who's worked for a long time with kids with complex communication needs, complex writing needs. Typically kids are, who are non-speaking and kids who have physical challenges. So I make sure that this is, becomes a part of my practice is letting kids just, even if it's just five minutes a day, have access to whatever keyboard, alphabet, whatever tool, alternative pencil we're experimenting with, and just so that they can make some marks with the mark maker of their future without any of the conventions of writing, spelling, punctuation, none of that put on top of it. What Gretchen has found in her research is if you do this, and at the same time, the children are experiencing phonic lessons and phonemic awareness, those letters start to show up in their writing, in their independent writing. So we want to make sure that as we're giving children these opportunities to write, that we give all children that opportunity to feel successful with whatever writing tool is going to be theirs, to give them opportunities and multiple opportunities, no matter what age or location, right? that the frequency is important. We try, it's writing isn't just something we do once a week when the OT comes into preschool, right? That it is something that is experienced throughout the day multiple times, right? And that we give kids lots of variety and choices so that they can, you know, practice whatever skill that it that needs to be to access those, um, to the alphabet, or the mark maker that they will be using. So then we're gonna get a little bit more into teaching strategies here. Donna? Yeah, so thanks, Kelly. I, I just love that example with that student. It really expands our concept of scribbling, mark making, and thinking about the future and engaging children. So when you think about infusing scribbling in your teaching, um, we, chose to organize um, four ways to think about scribbling uh, with our children. So one is finger scribbling, the second is scribbling with implements, collage scribbling, and text scribbling. And we're gonna talk uh, briefly about each of these and just know that when we talk about scribbling with implements and so forth, the next session, section, we're gonna talk about um, adaptations, but we're not gonna do it so much right here. So, and I just wanna share a word about um, modeling and the concepts of copying versus creating. Um, so much of when we're um, instructing and using strategies for mark making and writing and so forth, it's, it's a lot of copying, but I just want to, um, draw our attention to be being conscious of and blending the opportunities for children to create um, as well as copy what we're doing. So you know, like, um, go ahead, Cal. That, that the beginnings of scribbling into writing isn't all about tracing the dots. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but remembering that scribbling is about interaction. 
So it's about that. It's about play. It's about developing story. You know, we have so many children that are school age that struggle with topic selection when it comes to writing, you know, because writing often for them has been focused on the handwriting process rather than the cognitive act of process. So we want to make sure that we elevate these things of turn taking, labeling your drawing, you know, sharing those kinds of things are about what we do in our practice. We ask children to interact with us. Read what you just wrote, you know, whatever it might have been. Ask them to tell you about their drawing. You know, if it's unrecognizable, there may be a story in their head about what it is that they're writing about. Make sure that you are very accepting of what might appear to be an error, but that this was an opportunity for them to put a mark on paper or a mark on a braille page or a mark on an electronic page. Be very careful and, and, and many of us try not to do this, but we have to also curb the intentions of the people around students that are just developing scribbling to not expect or demand the conventions such as spelling words, sentences, you know, write your name, but just that they are really experimenting with the tool itself. I think sometimes people get overly concerned that if we don't get them along the spelling path, they never will be a speller. And what I found is that there are some children that have been overmanaged with their writing process, that they are now reluctant writers as first graders, second graders, and then of course the middle school and high school students that um, I meet. I now look at, at scribbling and all the different ways that we scribble. So I love that in pretend play situations, you know, if somebody can be a server and take an order is a way for them to scribble. Uh, for people to label their play, as the image on the right-hand side is a play group with um, zoo animals and they're labeling the zoo animals. The picture at the bottom is scribbling to make a road and the grass and the water on which those animals went on top of. You know, involve children in different purposes for their scribbling, card making, gift making. Um, family members love a personal gift that doesn't look like somebody else did it or did it hand over hand, right? Because children sensory wise, as many of you know, will often react negatively to the hand over hand experience because they're reacting to the sensory input and not following along with that. How does it, how does this help me make a mark? It's better to freehand it. So Donna. Yeah, thanks, Cal. So when we think again about subject matter, um, think about it from the perspective of the child. And so when, for example, when I used to always think subject matter around scribbling, it was about alphabet and numbers. And so I've really um, changed my practices and my thinking and in terms of really focusing on um, getting cues of subject matter from the child and, and what's important to them and what they want to express. And, um, and, and, and thinking deeply about the communication parts, that turn-taking, um, uh, trying to really explore um, what the child might want to um, express um, through mark making. So the implications for all of this as practi practitioners is to think about being uh, evolving and responsive to um, what we're seeing kids do and to work closely with parents and caregivers and be in the home and daycare. Now, we know this, um, uh, but when we think about mark making and scribbling um, and those early years and, and, and what we know about uh, the brain and neural pathways, you know, it's more important than ever to um, try and figure out how to be supportive of parents and um, mark making and to provide more tools um, at early ages 
you know, that baby aim, you know, accessible educational materials for babies and, and to work from the heart because then you can really um, uh, investigate and see what that, what each child is all about. So I thought maybe Deb, we could just take a breath here before we launch into tools to see people's thoughts or other ideas that they might have around this process and who or what questions you might have about the strategies of it. Like I said, we're gonna launch into a tools section next. Okay, uh, well, our group is hopefully not shy that hopefully they are uh, putting in the chat box or feel free to unmute yourself. Again, we are a community uh, who wants to support each other. So please put your questions out there. And Kelly, did, do you have a, also a case study uh, that we'll be talking about today? Our case studies are wrapped up in this presentation. So following, showing you Zoe and showing you um, Ethan are, are kind of wrapped up in the content. Okay, that's perfect. Perfect. So feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat box your questions, uh, your comments. What does this look like in your environments? Uh, we want to hear from you. And we'll keep an eye on that. I know a lot of people get tool happy. <laughs> Give me tools. I think that uh, the example with the the boy, the blind boy that was using the braille mark making tool, that that's phenomenal. I never would have thought about that. That's that's awesome. I will tell you that the first time that Donna showed that video during a presentation that uh, myself and our colleague Scott Marfilius were watching, Scott and I had to turn to the side because we were just like, oh my gosh, this is fabulous, that he was reaching up and feeling the Braille as he was producing it. Um, and that it just overwhelmed the two of us as early childhood educators. All right, well, let's launch a little well, bit. And Karen, Karen, oh, adds, Karen added that she likes the idea of using their future expression tools. And what does that look like? Alternative yeah. methods of output. Yeah, it's it, it, I, I, hopefully it helps to shift perspectives, right? That we're not just launching right into writing my name, writing, you know, so often I see kids get introduced to alternative keyboards or on-screen keyboards and people say to them, write your name. Well, that is a very specific cognitive task at the same time, they're learning a new tool. And where was their opportunity to experiment and scribble with that tool? So I think the red letter activities are what we used to say. You got two red letter things going on at the same time. And oh. you, you can't really do both. So you really need to focus on one activity. I love it. All right. Donna. So we're we're going to pop into... Um, some ways to look at um, how kids are scribbling in these four ways. And, and as you watch and think about this, and then we'll move into adaptations. But, you know, Kelly really turned me on to that term co-scribbling. Co so think about, you know, get your mind thinking in that direction as you listen to this. So, so with finger uh, scribbling. And these are new ideas. And you're going to have these. So I'm just going to read through these lists and not spend a whole lot of time talking about it. But you know, when you think about finger scribbling, you can think about doing it with paints, textures, paints. And I put in edibles here with a question mark, because it's, it's not my favorite thing to do. And um, that depends on families and kids and so forth. But I know um, I, I just wanted to put it in there because that's uh, a common thing for people to do, but I think it's between the family and the practitioner. And then there's fingerprints, you know, like using water, making fingerprints, um, stamping and so forth. Um, well, <clears throat> stamping would be more of a tool, but, um, but there's molded material. You can think about ways to scribble with that. And, and then um, water is a great way for scribbling. 
while we're watching the water scribbling, put in your favorite finger scribbling things. And if it's pudding, ooh. <laughs> So I love this dot idea of almost reverse scribbling, you know, where the chalk is all over the board and then you remove it. Um, I had an occupational therapist that we were working with a 16 year old who had not really ever been given the experience to develop any kind of handwriting. And we were trying to work on signing his name and those things. And what she would do is, is they would work on putting it on a write on wipe off board and then he would erase it off that right on wipe off board. So kind of following those like the, the reverse of the dot, dot, dot uh, following process. So we'll see what other people have added. Bathtub paints on a desk. Shaving cream is always the big, um, big one there to get that texture and, and smell and all the rest of the things that invite us to write. Um, other things. Go ahead, Donna. Oh, go ahead, Cal. Um, so other things with scribbling and scribbling with implements, and this is another thing that, you know, add your, your common tools that you use. We try to just kind of cover everything. Um, what I found really wonderful, I was um, consulting in a classroom in Canada that um, it was a mixed uh, K-1 classroom, just general ed classroom that had students with disabilities, two kids with um, identified disabilities in it. And the writing station of this teacher had all of these things in it. And so that all of the kids could experiment with what they were writing with. And so then when we were focusing on these two students with uh, more significant challenges, one could hold a traditional tool of writing and would experiment with the feels and textures of the different tools. The other student who had more physical challenges that we were looking at using alternative pencils, we didn't just make an alternative pencil for her. We made it so that it was in the same station, right? And so there were other kids that were pointing to letters and other people writing those letters down for them so that that child wasn't like, oh, this is only her thing that she uses. So making sure that these kinds of varieties are available to experiment with um, opens things up, I think, to a wide variety of kids. Um, Dr. Janet Sturm, who is the creator of the first author writing curriculum that I use a lot, it's a 14 point developmental writing scale that goes from non writing through the stages of scribbling till like around stage five or six when you write your first letter. Um, these are just some of the images that she uses with her. She does a lot of this with middle schoolers and high schoolers who are having their first writing experiences. So what are all of the ways in which tools are adapted so that they can be held on to? Um, in the assistive technology world, um, especially for those as occupational therapists and physical therapists, if you've not experienced Therese Wilkham yet, um, that is a person to look at in all the adaptations that Therese does with writing tools um, and handheld tools to make marks on tablets and those things. She'll show you how to make anything out of, you know, orthoplast or any other kind of handheld, you know, manipulating clay and those other kinds of materials. We do know that there are some things commercially available. Like we don't all have time to make things. Not all of us are the craftiest people ever. But you know, the different types of things that you can find in adapted art tools, things that have easy grip on them. You know, we do a lot of adaptations with using PVC piping, hot glue, and then looking at some of the things that can be adapted, like spin art that can be adapted to switch access. Um, kids looking at those multimedia magnetic drawing pads, you know, the, the nowadays Etch-a-Sketch um, and those kinds of things. That I will tell you that that lower right-hand tool, those kind of magnetic drawing tools are what my, brought my granddaughter back into the process of being interested in writing. Um, other things, kind of more non-traditional tools, 
again, as Donna said, we kind of have these lists and lists, um, are things like, you know, using glitter bags and using textured painting, bubble blowers, that anything that will splatter. Uh, Donna loves the, the water marbling where you drop the paint into water and then you can go in and, and make different designs out of it. And things that make dots, uh, the pendulum painting, so that it goes back and forth for kids who struggle to make those left and right and up and down kind of markers, uh, marks on paper. I just, you know, all of these things are a go, right? This is, this is the time to experiment, the time to explore, and the time to have fun with scribbling as, you know, a pre-writing or, or kind of prep piece of it. Kelly, did you name that uh, magnetic writing tool? That particular, I'm trying to remember the name of that particular one. I think this is the one from um, Crayola, but there's like 15 or 16 of these out on the market. Um, I can't even remember. There's one in my closet right now I could go get. Um, <laughs> but if you do a, do a search on draw pads, you'll find a variety. Some that have implements that you have to hold, some that uh, you know react to like this one to heat mapping. Um, of your finger on the surface. There are apps, we're gonna be talking about apps that you can do this like glow draw right on an iPad. So we're, we're getting, we're, we're moving our way up through the different types of tools. Um, Non-traditional tools and Donna can say a little bit, a lot more about the idea of collage and three dimensional types of, you know, mark making alternatives. So things that are made Velcro wise can stick on Velcro sensitive surface, those kind of self sticking shapes or letters and numbers. Um, ripping apart tissue paper in the lower right hand corner is um, a, a, a piece from my student that uses an eye gaze system where she was directing her caregiver as to where to put the foam shapes. So it really was a communication experience. They had just read the book about uh, Mutis and Pig Casso, um, and she wanted to make her own um, art from that. Donna, other things about the, the collage scribbling. Yeah, well, when you think about, for example, raised um, edge surfaces, you know, bringing in wiki stick you know, the, the waxed um, lines. You know, I'm a big fan of um, a cookie, cookie sheet and magnets. You can get um, magnetic material in all kinds of um, shapes. You can get it so that it can make lines and, and um, different kinds of shapes. And, um, you know, certainly the foam, the self-sticking foam you can get, and then you can, um, do a lot with that. I'll just mention that if you're involved with kids who really uh, need to benefit from three-dimensional, the American Printing House for the Blind um, has a lot of materials that are Velcro and, um, you know, raised, if you will. And it's just being creative and maybe not using them with the intended purpose they're selling them for, but use them for scribbling and co-scribbling. So we, we must have a thing about water <laughs> and the, and using water and scribbling because we tend to go that way. So this is just another quick video of how I've tried to tackle in my own life the reluctant writer because it doesn't look perfect. Um, so this is a video of my granddaughter, Lola, who again is the very reluctant writer, moved from tools to stickers we have, we have, you know, have discovered early on that she's a left-handed, um, moving towards being left-handed. And I think one of the things of that, how do we counteract some of the messages that children see where everybody around them writes in a certain way, everybody around them colors perfectly. And, and so this was one of the things that was found, first of all, to go on an airplane and not be messy but then also discovered that her love of it was because it does look good when it's done. 
kind of so you're just kind of she's just using the water pencil that comes yeah, with the crowd you know water sensitive um books and the nice thing is when they dry out they go back to white and black and you can use them again um and so she uses them and we talk about it so we're getting some of that experience without her reluctance for, I can't do this because it doesn't look perfect. And also just, you know, the whole sticker thing has exploded. So what she does to make stickers and stickers to um, describe it. On the right was a card she was sending to her aunt for her birthday. And she said what she was doing with the stickers was making a volcano. So we're getting that expressive piece in right, in whatever way we can. Um, we'll often see, I mentioned the first author writing curriculum, and one of the, the initial stages is having kids talk about their writing and choosing images as the, the first stages of writing. So whether they can draw the image with one of these tools we've talked about or pick an image. So in this particular K-1 classroom, they have a basket of images that the children have cut. So they use their um, OT time and there's um, fine motor time to cut pictures out of coloring books and cut pictures out of magazines and all kinds of things. And now when it comes to their writing time, they come to the bin and choose. So as they're thinking about what they want to write about, there are pictures of food in there, pictures of pets, people from magazines. And they find their topic there. So if you have somebody that struggles to draw a picture, we, let's find a picture, right? And we're going to use that picture to do our writing, right? And then off to the, the table she goes. Okay. Um, so Deb, I just have a quick question. I was going to um, ask you before we got started, uh, just to remind me, what's our timeline here? You have 11 minutes. Okay. Give and, we wanted to, and we wanted to have time for a little discussion, right? Um, answering questions is always a good thing. Yeah. So the fourth area then is tech tools for scribbling and examples. So um, you're going to have access to this list um, in your handout. I just want to say this, you know, the things I've mentioned here, glow draw, drawing pad, doodle buddy, Kids Doodle, Scribblify, Scribble and Write, those are all names of items that you can Google and find. And this is what you want to pay attention to with Tech Tools is the platform you're using, right? And um, what you find, because it's different. Some of these are for iDevices, some aren't. And so, um, and then they change. You know, my original list uh, um, changed. So I just encourage you, whatever um, tech tools that your um, child has access to, you want to go and explore what might be available for scribbling on the tech tool. And then when we think about um, using digital electronic tools for scribbling, you know, think what you can do with co-creating because there's some uh, tools that are a little bit more advanced. Um, there's some uh, programs called Explain Everything, Book Creator, and then Clicker has Clicker Books. So you can start into that literacy context in terms of creating and um, scribbling in that context, but it would take some co-creating. Um, kids wouldn't be able to do it on their own. So you're looking, starting to look at those tools then that mix the draw experience with the access to letters and letter experience. Right. So we also, in terms of, um, I was looking to the future in terms of um, digital um, format and electronic. Um, so there's um, a, a program that was emerging. Um, that we will show the video on this because I think it's using speech um, to do some uh, scribbling, drawing. There is a moon at night. 
two trees in the field. Some flowers. Far away, there's a house. So you can stop it, Kel. So just, um, you know, we all just have to periodically go and search and see what's out there, you know, with the tools that um, our kids have access to and their method of um, access. Um, so obviously a person would need some expressive language to be able to do something like this. So, so you can, you've got the link there or you can go and experiment with it. And the whole idea of talk to draw, draw a dog, you know, draw a cat or whatever it might be. So there are some examples here of um, braille tools that can be used for scribbling and co-creating and being exposed to the tools of their future. Um, and then also think about your kids who use switches. Um, there are several sources. This, these are some images from the Help Kids Learn website. And one of the great things with many of their products is that in the settings you set up, how are they going to be accessing this? Through a switch, how many switches? Through eye gaze, through a mouse or a mouse alternative of some type, or through a touch screen or a small or a smart board that they're drawing on. And a lot of them are about that experiment. And here's just a really quick look at Splodger because you know, there's nothing better than a noise that goes along with a scribble. So choosing what your access method is, choosing the dwell time settings of it. And, and then when the student touches the screen or they activate the switch or you know, use their um, eye gate on the bottle, nothing better than a good squish noise. I, I think if siblings were in the room, they'd really like uh, to participate in this one. Oh, yeah. I mean, nothing. there's nothing better than a fart noise. Um, and so other things we look to what young adults are using in their writing and how can I start to experiment this? Um, Lydia Dolly, who's the woman in the middle of the, our screen right now, developed her own stylus um, and she's experimented with it over time and now you know, has those available um, for sale and, and talks about it and shows people how to use them. But don't forget about the other kinds of styluses that are out there that kids might be accessing again, like the young man on the right uses a mouth wand and he is uses that now on his alphabet on his communication device, but it also could be something that they drew with. All those other kinds of things that, you know, you as OTs and PTs think about with kids that might how the positioning, the weight might help. Um, anything that helps to stabilize might be, you know, something to consider. And as I mentioned earlier, that we don't just have book bins in our classrooms, but scribbling bins too. And what I really love about this image from that Canadian K-1 classroom that I was in is that the teacher let the children write the labels. And so like envelopes in the upper right hand corner, you know, she had the unifix cubes, other things. And you saw children's development and writing as they um, and spelling as they went through the year with that. So quickly here, let's just we're going to mention some things about sharing scribbling because we've mentioned in the beginning that the context it about is sharing and communicative. So what does your scribble wall look like? Do you have electronic portfolios for children? Do you have ways of displaying? I love that this bottom right picture came from Pinterest, of course, you know, of a teacher that put everybody's current writing, whatever that looked like up as, you know, a picture, you know, an, an art framed picture. Having children share, having children take pictures of what they produced with their scribbling so that they can share it with people through, you know, their parents' email and through text messaging the images, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, my students share through Zoom, you know, and they talk about their topic and they show 
what letters they produced or the, the image that they chose. And having kids pair share, um, we know where they just can, can be quietly together without all the adult supervision that seems to happen ar around writing. And this is just an image from one of my students. Um, we have a Google slide deck that as she got started in the letters that she was typing, we captured either with taking a picture of it from what other people were writing for her as she chose letters with her eye gaze system. There are some evaluative tools, the bridge, take a look at the information from the um, Karen, Dr. Karen Erickson and Dr. David Copenhaver and the, and the kinds of measurement tools that they talk about in comprehensive literacy for all. Retopia has an emergent literacy tool that includes scribbling to writing. Um, and you'll find uh, um, Unique has an emergent writing assessment that includes drawing to scribble. So there are, there are tools out there. Uh, we also talk about rubrics and thinking about the information from today in those four areas of what kinds of scribbling, how they might be doing it so that you can kind of capture the process. And final thoughts as we wrap up our time, Donna. Well, I just, um, I'm going to skip over reading this. It's in the handout. It's just, you know, uh, a, a great um, reflection piece and a way to think deeper about writing and um, the rights of children with writing. All right. So Deb, we turn it back to you.